Good evening and welcome to the Burnsville Parks and Natural Resources Commission meeting for December 1st, 2014. The first item of business is to approve the agenda. Are there any items that commissioners would like to add to the agenda? Motion to approve? So moved. Do we need a second? Okay. Um, motion is uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion is uh, all opposed. Motion is approved. The second item for consideration is citizen comment. Is there anyone who would like to address the commission? Seeing none, we'll move to the third item of business, which is the approval of minutes for the meeting from October 6th. Commissioners, is there anything you would like to add to the minutes for the meeting of October 6th? Staff? Nothing from staff. Motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. And um, all uh, in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion is, um, it is passed. The fourth item to consider is the Vermilion River Watershed Presentation on Impaired Waters, presented by Daryl Jacobson and Travis Thiel. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, we have some staff here tonight from the Vermilion River Joint Powers Organization. Uh, they, along with city staff, have been working on uh, a report called TMDL for Impaired Waters in the Watershed, and they asked to come here tonight and present some information. We've been going through uh, the process of getting data and trying to finalize that report. It's in draft stage right now. Uh, Travis Teal is here. He's the watershed specialist uh, for the watershed. And uh, at the end, there'd be opportunity for questions. I'll stick around if you have any for Burnsville staff. And with that, I'll turn it over to Travis. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, commissioners. Good evening. Thanks for coming out on such a cold night. Uh, as Daryl mentioned, I'm Travis Teal. I work for the Vermilion River Watershed Joint Powers Organization. And I'm here to speak to you about a project called the Vermilion River Watershed Restoration and Protection Strategy, WRAPS or RAPS. Just one of the, the first of many acronyms that I'll use throughout the evening. And to aid you a little bit, I gave you a fine sheet of acronyms as we government and folk like to throw the acronyms out quite a bit. And uh, for those not familiar, I just wanted to, to brief you a little bit on those. Um, so throughout the presentation, you'll either see it or I'll say it, and you can refer to the list of acronyms and hopefully it's covered. Uh, just out of curiosity, as I don't know this group, um, how many of you have heard the term RAPS? None. One. Okay. How about TMDL? Okay. And then how about impaired waters? Okay. So we have some familiarity with it. All right. Um, I hate to cover stuff that you might already know. I never know exactly how to develop a presentation to cover all aspects of people's knowledge base, but uh, hoping I cover it here. Yes. Instead of the abbreviations, would you mind speaking the whole thing? <clears throat> I'll do my best. Thank you. I think we can all agree that a short and sweet presentation would be ideal, uh, so we can have time for discussion, and uh, then we can all go home and enjoy a warm evening in our homes. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief, but uh, to stay focused on getting there, these are the things that I plan to cover in this list. I'll just give you a one moment here to take a look at those. <clears throat> Let's start with who I represent. I uh, perform day-to-day -day work for the Vermilion River Watershed Joint Powers Organization. And for the purposes of this presentation, I'll just call it the Vermilion River Watershed or Watershed for simplicity. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, we are a joint powers organization in a local government unit formed between Dakota and Scott County uh, with the primary purpose of managing, protecting, and improving the water resources uh, within our boundary. The watershed boundary covers a large portion of Dakota County and a small portion of southeast Scott County. Eighteen communities, cities, and township are wholly or partly within the Dakota County portion of the watershed, and two communities are within the Scott County portion. Um, as you can see, this, the, the watershed's central feature is the Vermilion River and its tributaries. 
<clears throat> but there are also some, some, some lakes, wetlands, and other resources that we work to manage, protect, and improve. And just for your reference, for those directionally challenged, Burnsville is in the upper northwest corner, upper left-hand side. For those of you that uh, didn't raise your hand when, when you, I asked uh, about impaired waters, uh, not familiar with impaired waters, they are a water body that um, would be a lake, stream, or river that are not meeting water quality standards for its intended use, be it for consumption, for uh, aquatic recreation, or for aquatic life that lives within it. These standards oops, are established by the state and federal government to be protective of these uses. And in order to determine if a water is impaired, monitoring data must be collected, analyzed, and assessed in order to determine if the resulting data is indicating impairment or not. And if it does indicate impairment, the water gets added to the Environmental Protection Agency's 303D impaired waters list. Once listed, the EPA requires a TMDL to be created. And we'll talk about what a TMDL is shortly. This map illustrates all the various impaired waters that exist within the Vermilion River watershed. Some are overlaying on top of one another. Basically, what you need to know is that anything that's kind of colored or has multiple layers of colored is an impaired water within this watershed. Alamagnet Lake is in the upper left-hand corner for your reference. <clears throat> um, many of these impaired waters that are on this map are included in the RAPS project that I'll be talking about tonight. Within the portion of Burnsville that is within the Vermilion River watershed, Alamagnet Lake is impaired for excess nutrients. In Minnesota, excess nutrient impairments are usually a result of excess phosphorus reaching the lake or within the lake itself. The city has other impaired waters that uh, you may already know about. Um, I'm aware of Crystal and Keller Lake. I'm a little bit familiar with those. Um, but they're addressed through other TMDLs that have been completed already and not within our watershed, and they're not included in this project. Moving on to what a TMDL is, a TMDL or total maximum daily load, simply put, is just a number. Uh, this number is derived by calculating the maximum amount of a pollutant that a water body can receive and still meet water quality standards. Once the number is known, it's a matter of allocating pollutant reduction responsibility to those areas and communities that drain to the impaired water. <clears throat> this is the basic math behind a TMDL. Uh, it's the sum of all waste load allocations plus the sum of all load allocations plus, plus a margin of safety plus a reserve capacity. A waste load allocation would be all the permitted sources within uh, the drainage area of the impaired water. These would be things like cities, counties, uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation, uh, wastewater treatment plants, construction sites, industrial sources, and uh, there might be a few others. Uh, load allocation is all the sources that are not permitted, and these would be things like contributions from unincorporated areas, uh, air, air deposition, and most importantly, and what's going to be most ap applicable to um, Alamagnet Lake is the internal nutrient load. That is the nutrients that are already in the lake uh, that contribute to the problematic water quality conditions there. Uh, the margin of safety is a measure set by the state to make sure we meet the TMDL, and the reserve capacity uh, is... Uh, accommodating for some level of uh, change or future capacity within the drainage area of an impaired water. The last line of this table is the TMDL, that number I talked about. So if you look at the very last line, it says total load. Uh, the existing total phosphorus load in a year's time to Alamagnet Lake is 386.1 pounds. <clears throat> the allowable TP load or the total maximum daily load is 218.5 pounds which means there is an, an estimated 167.6 pounds that needs to be reduced. Um, this table breaks it out into the specific allocations I was referring to. What you need to know about this table are the items in the red. Of the total waste load allocation, <clears throat> the city of Burnsville is currently contributing 89 pounds of phosphorus to the lake. The math is telling us that in order to do your share of pollutant reduction, you can only contribute 63.4 pounds of phosphorus which is a reduction of 25.6 pounds. A TMDL will require the city to meet this reduction, and the stick is the city's municipal separate storm sewer system, or MS4 stormwater permit. Uh, this permit and the reporting associated with it 
will be used as a tool by the state to track progress on meeting these TMDL goals. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, the load allocation uh, is primarily caused by internal nutrient load, as I mentioned earlier, namely the nutrients within the bottom sediments, uh, the nutrients in the vegetation within the lake, and the nutrients within the water column itself. Currently, this load is estimated at 183.9 pounds of phosphorus, and only 77.2 pounds are allowed, which means there needs to be a 106.7 pound reduction in phosphorus. And although the city is not legally required to meet this load reduction goal, the lake will not meet water quality standards, standards without meeting both the waste load allocation and the load allocation goal. So RAPS, again, stands for Watershed Restoration and Protection Strategy. It's the Minnesota Pollution Controls Agency's most recent process of developing and addressing total maximum daily loads. Uh, in the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's previous efforts, total maximum daily loads were conducted on a lake by lake or river by river basis, typically only for one pollutant at a time. Uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency determined that many of these waters that are impaired are interconnected in some way, thus one may affect the other. Uh, in other words, many of these impaired waters were, th were within the same watershed, meaning you know it drains from one place to another. Um, it made more sense to determine causes of pollution and solutions based on the fact that they exist within the same watershed and what we do to one water may have an impact on another. Uh, in the Vermilion River wraps, we're taking all the impaired waters that do not already have a TMDL, creating those TMDLs, and then developing possible solutions to meet the standards. Uh, another aspect in the, the wraps that is new is that strategies are being developed for those waters that are not yet impaired. Uh, this would be considered the protection strategies. Uh, we want to keep those pet, those waters that are not yet impaired off of the impaired waters list because it's a lot cheaper to do it that way than actually fix it once it's already broken. Uh, the other big reason that we do all these TMDLs and develop solutions all at once is that we have some efficiencies gained uh, in the overall process. You think about the civic engagement, the stakeholder process, public notices, that sort of thing. If you did it on a water by water basis, it would take a long time to get all the public notices and do all the rigmarole for that. Uh, in this process, you just do it one time and it's, it's addressed. If I were in your shoes, I'd be asking myself, why does this matter to me? Well, waters like many natural resources are a shared resource. That means that everybody that uses or has an effect on these resources has some level of responsibility. And for the city of Burnsville and Apple Valley, as the two cities basically split the lake, Alamagnet is on your back doorstep and parts of your city drain to the lake. Uh, that means that the share that you have responsibility for is probably greater than most. In fact, with the TMDL, your share is legally required via the Clean Water Act, and you must show progress towards meeting water quality standards. Uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency issues the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System stormwater permit to the city allowing the city to discharge stormwater to surface water resources. And once this total maximum daily load is approved, the city will be expected to document progress towards meeting the water quality goal if it's allowed to continue to discharge stormwater to surface waters. Uh, we know you can do that. Uh, we've seen it in some of the other work that you guys have done, Crystal and Keller Lake, uh, for example. Uh, you probably do it in, in everything you do on a daily basis. You have tools like local ordinances and other controls to help you meet these goals. You and the city staff have ground level of knowledge of what's happening within your city. And lastly, you know the residents and they and their behaviors will be key to meeting water quality goals here. The city is already doing some good things to address the needs of the lake. Uh, just to name a few, nuisance and rough fish management and nuisance aquatic plant management have occurred. Uh, maintenance of stormwater ponds uh, is another thing that has happened out there. Um, and the city's been active at implementing these for a while. Um, and all these things are really helping, uh, but we're not there quite yet. Uh, the watershed staff and city staff are working now to identify uh, a, and develop a more comprehensive project list that will meet the reduction requirements for Burnsville and the other MS4s. It will also address the internal load so that when the projects are actually implemented, we believe that you will meet the target goals that uh, we have set in the TMDL and, and the lake will meet its water quality standards. <clears throat> Keep in mind that this commission can have a large impact as well. 
uh, on top of the activities identified for the implementation, your commission can have an influence over what happens in the city's parks, open spaces, and natural resources. That may also help us get to the target sooner. Uh, outside of what this commission can specifically do, other committees and city staff can have an impact too. Uh, if land disturbances are proposed uh, within the drainage area to the lake and they come in for a permit, uh, rather than just rubber stamping it, think of it as an opportunity to look at something uh, in a little different way that there may be a, an opportunity to do some sort of water resource positive with that permit. Um, <clears throat> In the city's day-to-day -day operations, uh, you consider things like road maintenance, park operations, infrastructure improvements, and many others. Uh, these are probably pretty standard operations uh, from a day-to-day -day basis for city staff, but they all may hold opportunities to address water quality, uh, but you need to be looking for those opportunities. Uh, engagement of the locals will be a key in meeting the lake's water quality goals. The neighborhoods draining to the lake are primarily residential, so we have a lot of residents. And we also have residents right along the shore of the lake that live on it. Their behaviors, actions, and buy-in will be fundamental to meeting the goals, so it's very important that we engage them properly. Partnership opportunities exist, not only with the Vermilion River watershed, but with others as well. Uh, grants from state agencies, research projects in conjunction with universities, and projects in collaboration with nonprofits are just a few examples of possible partnerships that we've had ourselves or we have seen elsewhere. We also want you to help us with solutions. We have a pretty solid understanding of the problem and some good ideas to solve it. But the slate's very big uh, with lots of room for ideas that you can help us create. Your understanding of the area is much better than ours, and it's crucial to identifying solutions and opportunities and getting them done. Uh, lastly, we realize that the city will have requirements to be accountable, and we want you to feel like you have a higher level of accountability as the lake is within your city. But you're not alone in that accountability because the Vermilion River Watershed wants to help you achieve those goals. Our organization has a budget dedicated to implementation projects. If a good project is identified, we're willing to help pay the costs of getting it done. We have staff that can assist you with education, communication, and civic engagement efforts to help resolve some of the lake's problems. Uh, we have a stewardship grant program that would fall under that category. If further funding is needed, we can identify projects in future years' budgets and make sure that we have the means to implement them. We can utilize our local experts at the Dakota County Soil and Water Conservation District, or we can hire scientists and engineers from private companies to accomplish the feasibility and design aspects of the project. We've previously been successful at applying for and receiving grant funding for implementation projects in this watershed, and we'd be happy to do the same for Alamagnet Lake. Uh, the Vermilion River watershed also has existing partnerships that we'd be willing to extend your way. Um, one example would be our Vermilion Stewards. It's a group of volunteers organized by the Friends of the Mississippi River uh, who conduct stewardship activities in the watershed, and these uh, activities would be anything from buckthorn removal to native plantings, water-friendly landscape events, rain barrel workshops, stormwater stenciling, and many others. I guess the big message is, is that we're here to help and do good things for the lake. In closing, we wanted to let you know where the project is at in the process. All the TMDLs, including Alamagnet's TMDL, are in a draft form right now and will be in the Environmental Protection Agency's hands in December for a preliminary review to make sure that there are no glaring problems with it. Uh, we have been and will continue to develop the implementation strategies with the MS4s concurrent with that review. The plan right now is to have the TMDLs and the RAP strategies ready for public notice in early 2015 with subsequent approval by the EPA around May 2015. With that, I'll ask if there are any questions. Our staff contact information for the Vermilion River Watershed Joint Powers Organization is here, as well as the link to our website. Uh, feel free to check that out if you like. Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll take questions. Um, I will just mention that we did uh, put together a couple of fact sheets, um, two in particular. One is on Alamagnet Lake and uh, the TMDL uh, specific to Alamagnet Lake for you. We also developed one that's more generic that we're planning to use watershed-wide about best management practices that could be implemented anywhere within this watershed that would help achieve us wa achieve the, the water quality goals that we'll have with TMDLs. Thank you, Mr. Teal. Yeah. Uh, commissioners, 
Questions and comments? Yes, ma'am. Good question. When did you start collecting baseline data for all this Vermillion watershed area? I guess I would defer to Daryl. Your city has been the one coordinating the data collection on Alamagnet Lake. Uh, Al Magnet has been in the, the camp citizen assisted monitoring program uh, where we have a volunteer that lives on the lake, goes out twice a month and collects uh, water quality data. And that has been going on for over 10 years. And so as part of this process, um, we gave the watershed, you know, all of our past data. We also did uh, a joint lake management plan with Apple Valley, I think around 2001. And so we had some more in-depth data from that um, study, and that was passed along uh, to the watershed as well. And so they used all that information as they did some of the modeling and, um, you know, work coming up with these numbers. Go ahead. The, what about the rest of the Vermilion watershed? What, what have you, how far back have you started putting data together to find out how much progress you're making? Uh, the Vermilion Watershed, uh, the Joint Powers Organization specifically, has nine gauging stations set up on the Vermilion River and its tributaries uh, where we monitor stream flow and water quality samples. Um, we've been probably conducting some of that since the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, some of the more recent stations probably just within the last few years. Um, as far as progress goes, we've seen huge progress since, say, the early to mid-50s, you know, just based on some empirical data, but also just qualitative data from the time of, you know, rivers burning and sewage treatment dumping directly into the river. Um, some of the wastewater treatment plants that used to discharge to the river have now gone offline or are redirected elsewhere, um, and we've seen significant improvements in the, the 2000s because of that as well. Um, we we'll plan to continue to see improvements, but uh, the watershed is large and we have um, many different types of land use uh, to deal with and progress will be slow, but we will get there. What, what is your biggest source of pollution? What have, you, what have you started with and what was the biggest source? In, in the watershed itself, the entire watershed, it's sediment. Uh, we have way too much sediment reaching um, portions of the Vermilion River and its tributaries. Um, generally, it's not in the upper watershed, say, from Highway 52 upstream or west. Um, most of it is not coming from bank erosion. It's coming just from overland sources uh, based on the land uses that we're seeing there, both urban and uh, agricultural. Thank you. I'm not sure I understand fully what that means. From, from sediment from residential areas right so anything within the streets that dumps into the storm sewer system okay that that, does that include leaves leaves okay grass clippings um, you know you think about after a winter time uh, of snow accumulation after they make huge piles of snow you see it melt there's a pile of sand and silt and materials sitting there mm -hmm. that sort of stuff gets into the storm sewer system if it's not swept up in okay. a timely manner or if we get a big rain before the sweepers can get out Okay. And the, the sediment itself has a lot of potential to carry phosphorus and other pollutants with it. Of course. So I'm unclear. Does Brentsville have a strategy at this time to deal with The lake that? management plan had a number of strategies. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the fish management, uh, the nuisance aquatic plant management, and some of the stormwater ponds were things that the city has done. Um, I'm sure you've done a lot more from a public engagement stormwater stenciling and, and outreach standpoint as well, which are huge efforts. Um, some of the strategies that, you know, we're just in the early stages of developing now might include things like a partial lake drawdown um, that would help to kill off some of the nuisance aquatic plants that are within the lake, help consolidate some of the sediments in the bottom of the lake so that it doesn't release phosphorus as easily. Um, one could consider alum treatment. It's a chemical treatment where it binds the phosphorus and doesn't allow it to release from the sediments in the bottom of the lake. Uh, there are a number of different things that we'll, we'll try to develop and come up with a, a decent comprehensive list to choose from, but we want effective solutions that we can really do on the ground. Um, and that would be whether it's in, you know, on city property or in people's backyards or front yards. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. Yes, Commissioner? Um, what's the time frame for trying to get the Lake Owl Magnet within the, the standards, trying to get rid of the 25.6 pounds reduction, in what we're putting in, and the 106 that's left? Yeah, usually it's um, like a 20-year time frame is what the, city, uh, the state would desire. If we get there sooner, that's great. I would like to get there sooner. 25.6 pounds, as far as the legal requirements go, isn't all that much. Um, We've developed a few projects in the last couple of years that have actually done about 20 pounds of phosphorus removal in one project. So uh, depending on the project type, the scale, how much drainage area it, it captures, you know, we can get there with a few good projects. Um, the in-lake phosphorus source is going to be the bigger challenge and usually is the bigger challenge, how you deal with that. Thank you. So is the final goal lake clarity or is it phosphorus numbers now? Both. Um, Clarity is usually a result of low amounts of phosphorus. The, the algae within the lake feed on the phosphorus, so the more phosphorus you have, the more algae you have, and that decreases your clarity. So it's kind of a combination of all those factors. Um, aquatic recreation is the desired use on this lake, so we want to have it in a, you know, a fairly clear state uh, so that people feel like they can go swim, boat, do what it, you know, those sort of aquatic recreation activities the lake would allow. So if, okay. I, re if I remember most of the math behind that, um, most of the overages was coming from the load allocation, not the city itself. Right. So will Burnsville also be involved in the strategy to lessen the load allocation? Legally, you don't have to be. However, as I said, if we don't address both the required sources, the waste load allocation, mm -hmm. and the load allocation, which are, are the, the non-legally requiring sources, the in-lake sediment primarily sources, um, it won't meet its standards. So although the city might do its part and get the 25.6 pounds down, you're not going to see a clear lake because of that 25.6 pound reduction. Um, the largest source, the internal nutrient load source, would have to be reduced significantly to start seeing some progress. So if the city wants to be a part in that, we certainly invite that and we'll help them, um, you know, with the implementation projects to do that. Go ahead, Commissioner. Do we currently have any uh, stormwater direct sources discharging into Ella Magnet Lake? I believe so, but you, you might know better than I. Yes, there's a, a residential area uh, that's on the lake that doesn't currently receive any stormwater treatment. Um, most of the watershed, I think when we did our original plan in, in 2000 or 2001, uh, about, I think it's 80%, between 75 and 80% of the phosphorus going into Al Magnet from Burnsville is going through stormwater ponds, but there is uh, a piece that's currently untreated. Other questions or comments from the commissioners? And we're looking for, this was just for um, information and feedback. We're not looking for any um, motions. That is correct. Okay. Um, and from here, where would you like to go? Uh, I believe Daryl will uh, come back to us at a later time with additional information on, on projects that, uh, that may be forthcoming on, on Lake Ella Magnet. Okay. Yeah, as we develop the implementation strategies, uh, there will be certainly more opportunity to take a look at that list as well as an actual public hearing process for it. So um, we welcome you to help us create that list. Uh, we'll be working with Daryl um, quite extensively to try to get that list buttoned up as tightly as possible so that we have clear goals moving forward to get projects in the ground. Sounds like an excellent plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Teal, and thank you, Daryl, for your presentations. Um, once again, moving ahead, the next item on the agenda is the Lions Playground survey results presented by J.J. Ryan. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Um, I have before you tonight an item that came uh, from your 2014 annual work plan. Uh, we set that work plan about a year ago, back in January. And then uh, at our July meeting, we discussed the 
possible questions for the survey that went out to the users of the Lions Playground at Cliff Fen Park. We conducted that survey uh, late summer, early fall, and actually uh, we got the information out to park users through our communications department, also down at the park, and through uh, some of our various mailers that went out to residents in the city. Uh, we did receive 61 respondents, and as I said earlier, I think I said earlier, we had 10 questions on that survey. It was conducted on SurveyMonkey. So uh, what I have tonight are just those results. I believe you received those also in your packets, but we'll just go through them really quickly and um, be happy to discuss them if you have any questions. Uh, here's the overview of the, the playground itself. I think this is helpful, um, especially when you get to some of those comments uh, at the end of the survey about uh, not enough benches, and although these aren't the actual, this isn't the actual photo of the playground, um, it is representative of the fact that there might not be a lot of shade in the area just yet. Uh, so here we go. The first question we asked was how often do you visit the park or the playground? Uh, most of the respondents uh, said, or half of them said that they were coming about once a month, 40% uh, coming two or three times a month. And then we have a few diehards coming two or three times a week. I would imagine those are uh, some of the younger families with uh, stay-at-home moms and, and kids at home with them. So we do have some regular users down there. Um, second question we asked is, what time do you typically visit the park? Morning, afternoon, and evening. Um, pretty balanced, but again, a lot of our folks are using the park uh, in the morning hours. How many children do you bring to the park? We asked this question specifically because a lot of people were, uh, or, or you folks were recognizing the fact that there are a lot of um, daycares and uh, local agencies that are bringing their, their, their kids while they're coming or are going to a field trip. So there are a number of larger groups that are using the park, which is great. But um, unfortunately for us, the number of respondents that we received uh, most of those people responding, as you can see, are only bringing one or two children, so we're not getting a response here from a lot of those agencies that are bringing kids to the park. Fourth question, again, uh, what are the ages of the children you're bringing to the park? Again, 60 people responded, um, but if you can see there in the, in the responses side, it lists about 92 kids that are coming. So again, parents are bringing multiple kids with them to the park. Uh, of those 92 children, uh, they are coming to the park, 42 of them were younger between the ages of 2 and 4. Uh, so you can see we do have younger kids enjoying that park. In our fifth question, we asked, uh, what is your relationship to the child? Again, we were seeing a lot of daycare uh, providers bringing kids, um, but here you can see the responses that it is a lot of families that are coming down to use the park. And again, it doesn't really surprise me based on the survey. I don't know that a daycare provider or a, a daycare agency is going to take the time to respond to our service. In our sixth question, we asked, uh, what was your child's favorite attraction at the park? Uh, there are your answers there. Um, there are a couple different spinners, for lack of a better term, uh, spinner items. Uh, one is for younger kids to sit down and hold on to. The other one is a hanging spinner. Uh, but you can see uh, that is one of them, as well as the slides. There are about four or five slides now at the park that the kids are really starting to enjoy. But as you, you saw in your responses, apparently some of those are getting rather hot during the midday sun, and hopefully that will correct itself once the trees grow in fully. Uh, in our seventh question, we asked, how far did you travel? Again, I think, commissioners, this is, uh, this is another question you were curious to know the answer on. Uh, the park does attract a lot of users and a lot of users from outside of the area. Again, based on how we collected our data, I don't know that we reached families in Bloomington or parts of Egan or Lakeville that are using the park. Uh, so you can see most of the respondents are pretty, pretty local or pretty near the park uh, with only a few of them coming from farther out. In our eighth question, again, we asked how did you get to the park? Uh, again, that was, uh, I think, a question that we asked. Uh, we were looking for uh, folks that are using the bike trails in the area, things like that. Not a surprise, though, that most of the people are getting there uh, using their vehicle. Cliff, Cliff Road is a very busy road. 
There was part of the summer that uh, we were under construction right in front of the park, so uh, it doesn't surprise me that most of the people are getting there with their, with their vehicles. And uh, our ninth question, we asked if they had any safety concerns uh, regarding the park. We did, um, we did get a few people, uh, nine or ten responses, to tell us that they did have some concerns about the park. Uh, here are those, that feedback that we received. Obviously, the first one is not in regards to Cliff Fen Park. They're talking about their neighborhood park, uh, which I'm not certain of that equipment that's at Meadows, uh, Meadow Circle Park, but it's something we will look into. Um, I found some of these responses um, interesting. Others do make sense. Uh, you want to keep kids away from the trains. That makes sense. <laughs> in the spring when there wasn't any leaves on those trees, uh, when a train comes by, kids want to go. And uh, so I think that was cause for some parents' uh, concern. Uh, same thing with the fencing around, around the area would keep the kids in the play area and not running over to see the trains. And uh, one of the concerns that I noticed in there was that the kids were too young for some of the equipment. And um, at that park, we did design the equipment for various kids of all ages and of all abilities. And there are actually signs up on the equipment that, you know, this area is for toddlers ages two and three. This area is for ch children ages four to six or whatever it might be. Um, so there, there are some of those concerns, but again, we tried to address those by, by labeling it and the, the equipment itself that's, that's in the area. So. And then finally, we asked, uh, how would you add or, or would you add or change anything to the park? Um, considering the viewing spaces, the benches, the attractions, things like that. And uh, plenty of people were kind enough to give us their responses. There were a number of questions about adding a splash pad. Uh, commissioners, I think you know we are already looking at that. We tried once this year, but again, the construction prices were, went through the roof. Uh, we are going to revisit that. Hopefully we'll have a splash pad in that park in 2015. Again, depending on, depending on uh, pricing and how things go, again, we're shooting for next year with that splash pad. Uh, benches, we put as many benches out as we could afford. Uh, that was one of the things where we had to scale it back a little bit, but it obviously makes sense. Uh, the overview picture you saw, they are, there are a few benches and they are scattered, uh, but the parents are looking for a few more. We can certainly take a look at that as, as the years go on about adding benches or adding different viewing areas while we're in the park. Um, one of the items that was also in there that I noticed, and, and I think, uh, Commissioners, some of you may have had a concern about it, was the cleanliness of the facilities there, the portable toilets that we have. Um, at this time of year, I think we were cleaning the toilets, or we, we stepped up the number of cleanings to those restrooms to three times a week and we tried to do one on the weekend. So um, I think we tackled that. I didn't hear too many complaints after that, or I didn't hear any complaints after we stepped up the number of cleanings we had, and we added another portable toilet down there. So um, hopefully we've, we've overcome that obstacle, but um, we're certainly willing to change that if there are still concerns over the number of, or the cleanliness of the facilities. And then also I'd like to point out that there were a few people that wanted to say thank you to the Lions Club once again, for their uh, generosity and their donation of that playground. So, um, Commissioners, I, there's a whole list of, of responses there to that last question. They were in your packet. You're welcome to look through them again. If you have any questions on those, we can certainly back up and discuss one of them. Uh, but with that, Commissioners, I think that um, puts an end to the to the uh, item that you had on your work plan regarding a survey of the folks at Lions Playground. Um, unless there's anything else that we missed or unless there's some follow-up you'd uh, like me to, to try to get. Just a quick question. Commissioner? What, what is the process after a survey like this? You get information like some safety concerns and the benches that you would go to to implement some of the changes? Sure. Certainly we, we're taking a look at those safety concerns and if it is, if it is an item that we can address we, we will certainly do whatever we can to do that. Um, I, I know there was a concern in there that some of the equipment was too big for a two-year-old. Well, we want children of all ages to use the equipment, so that's, that's an item that we're not going to change out that equipment. Um, we're hoping that a parent or a nanny or a grandparent can Mom. steer their child to 
the right play equipment for them. I, w I was thinking mostly about um, some sort of fence, just because the kids are young that use that park, two to four year olds, and they yeah. can get away from you. <laughs> well, we, like, as I said earlier, uh, Commissioner, we are looking at a splash pad for next year. Uh, and so with that, we will take a look at how we, um, I guess, secure that area and, and prevent kids from going into the fen or down onto the railroad tracks if that is becoming a problem. There is a fence right there right now. It's an older, probably three or four foot high wooden fence, but uh, certainly it does keep out the, the kids from getting into that area. But I, again, I can imagine that there is a concern from parents when a train comes by and mm -hmm. Kids want to rush that direction. I can certainly understand that. Commissioner Nachman? JJ, what percent of the 60 respondents would you guess is the percentage of the actual number of kids that would, over the summer area, participate in enjoying the park? Mr. Nachman, that is a, that is a very good question. I, I wish I had an answer for you. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to factor in all of the the things that could have brought kids to the park or kept kids away. <clears throat> I know we had a, a terribly wet June, and so I don't know that there was a lot of time for kids to to use the park in in middle of June when school first let out. So I wish I don't have an answer for you, Commissioner. I I, I would guess this represents a very small percentage of the hundreds and maybe thousands of kids that utilize that park. And in a way, I'm surprised you got as many responses as you did. And I think overall, uh, I would just sum it up and say, I would thank the Lions Club for what they did and, you know, tell people that we feel that, at least I do, that we thank you very much. Some people have I other ideas, but Overall, I think it was a wonderful gesture for them. So, absolutely, I'll, I'll make sure that uh, they hear the comments as well from the the folks that responded. That, that they're very appreciative of of the playground again down at uh, Cliff End Park and the Lions Playground. So, uh, commissioners, anything, any other uh, questions or feedback on this? Yes, go ahead. Thank you for doing the survey. It, I think in future parks, we know of some other items that we may be more in more interested in making sure features in the future because I think fencing makes a lot of sense and I've, I've ran after my kid too and it's nice when you have that one enter entrance and exit at, you know you know if you sit there there they can't get past you I think it's I, I love the park and I'm glad to hear what little you know there's small improvements that we can make in other parks too in the future so thank you for doing the survey it brings a lot for us to think about in the future thank you Okay, I think that wraps up that um, item on the agenda. Moving along, we have uh, the next item is miscellaneous. Uh, do we have any miscellaneous to cover? Uh, commissioners, I believe the only information that I have for you is that our next meeting will be on January 5th. Um, at that time, we will go through uh, our election of a new chair and vice chair. Doesn't, I guess I shouldn't say that. It doesn't have to be a new new chair, vice chair, but we'll go through the election process. Uh, we will also develop our work plan for 2015, and uh, we are also going to review uh, and make any recommendations on our measurement document for our city council to review at their all-day work session. So I will get information out to you as early as I can so that you have an opportunity to review those documents prior to the meeting uh, so that we are prepared to discuss and make any recommendations at, on our meeting, at our meeting on January 5th. Okay, very good. Um, any other items commissioners would like to share? And nothing else from staff? That's it. Okay, that brings us to the end of our formal meeting agenda. A motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the motion is approved. Uh, that brings us to an end of the meeting. Thank you all for attending and watching the Burnsville Parks and Natural Resources Commission.